Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday night, May 29th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here is a little taste of what's coming up tonight. Tonight, how the Patriot Act took down its key supporter. Then, Rex Jones asks, what is the TPP? And live coverage from the Mohammed Cartoon Contest in Phoenix. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. ISIS has vowed to attack it right around 6.15 when they're expected to have prayer time. Well, we are bringing you a very live, extended version of the InfoWars Nightly News tonight. God willing, we are going to be Skyping in live with Joe Biggs. Uh, he's in the air right now, but he should be touching down in Phoenix, Arizona. They're having another rally for free speech there. And, you know, we said, Biggs, do you want to go? And he had already had his flight booked. So God willing, he'll get there in time. Uh, so we're going to be shooting this edition of the news live tonight and just going as long as it takes. We're going to have a lot of reports for you. I'll be joined in studio by David Knight and Rob Dew here coming up. We're going to uh, try to take some of your questions live on Twitter. I'll tell you how to do that here coming up soon. Um, but let's get into the news. So this weekend, the uh, the Patriot Act is set to expire. And a lot of people are, are kind of really hoping that they they allow this to expire and not just have a pass it to find out what's in it type moment. It's set to expire midnight Sunday. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Obama is saying there's just a handful of senators standing in the way of the Patriot Act. Now, without action by midnight Sunday, a number of tools that permit law enforcement to pursue and investigate suspected terrorists will expire. Obama, of course, he's pulling out the terrorism card. He says, I don't want us to be in a situation in which for a certain period of time, those authorities go away and suddenly we are dark. And heaven forbid we've got a problem where we could have prevented a terrorist attack or apprehended someone who is engaged in dangerous activity. So there he goes, throwing that out there. Heavens forbid there's some kind of a terrorist attack and there's just a handful of senators in the way. I mean, pointing out the obvious here that the Patriot Act and NSA, they have not stopped a single terrorist attack at this point. They were just scooping up the data of a lot of innocent Americans and people around the world. Um, and possibly one of the reasons why a lot of these uh, senators and, and people there are standing in the way of the Patriot Act is because of uh, what happened to their good bunny, Dennis Hastert. Now, we'll talk about him a little bit more coming up later in the news, but uh, uh, Dennis Hastert is the former House Speaker. He was the one who pushed for the Patriot Act initially. He took credit for the passage of the Patriot Act uh, in 2001, as well as getting it reauthorized in 2005. And it is the very provisions in the Patriot Act that led to his indictment. So I think a lot of senators there are kind of saying, well, wow, hey, we already know that they're building a case against all of us to just kind of use whenever they want to bring the hammer down on somebody. But here again, not for a terrorist, even if the guy is reprehensible and has done some real dirty deeds in his past, they didn't take him down for the dirty deeds. They took him down because he was using his cash money in a way that they did not like. So more on that coming up. But the NSA has already said that if their surveillance program ends, they're going to keep that treasure trove of all your phone data that they've collected. Now, if it, if it expires midnight Sunday, they're already getting things prepared, uh, moving things out of the way. Um, they say they're going to isolate the computer servers where they're stored and block any investigators access. But they're not going to destroy the database if its legal authority to collect this material expires on schedule this Sunday. So they're just going to hold on to it until some terror event happens. And then everyone is calling for them to reinstate this program, which once again, if a terror attack does happen, the NSA will not be around to stop it. Uh, but Obama has said uh, other law enforcement has said that they have some other tools in their tool bag that they can use to stop this terrorism, stop terrorist activities. And a school in Orange, Orange County is actually going to start monitoring their students on social media using one of these tools. Now, uh, this is a Snap Trends. They've got an annual license for this. Snap Trends is actually a software company based right out of here in Austin. Uh, but this software monitors Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. 
And the school said it plans to use this software to conduct routine monitoring for the purposes of prevention or early intervention of potential issues in which students or staff could be at risk to themselves or others. So they're going to proactively prevent and intervene. So they're doing all this to proactively prevent and intervene. Kids do stupid things, and we get it, and they do a lot of these really stupid things on social media. Uh, But this is getting these kids prepared to be under perpetual surveillance. And now, not just perpetual surveillance, but engaging in pre-crime, okay? But once again, not for terrorists, it's for average Americans, young people here in school, because the jihadists, check this out, they've got a help desk. (laughs) So ISIS has created an online help desk to teach their fellow comrades safe practice and help them develop their own secure communications. This is a study based out of the U.S.-based Counterterrorism Center. So (laughs) ISIS is giving online training, educating their colleagues how to use established techniques for online privacy, such as the use of virtual private networks. Uh, They're teaching them how to use tools such as Tor, um, advising them against using regular popular platforms like Skype, Gmail, Google, and WhatsApp. Um, And then the report says that we found conversations indicating that jihadis are in the early stages of developing secure communications and browsing programs independent of the efforts by Western privacy advocates, and they're also working on developing their own software, the study found. So always, right on time, ISIS is doing something that lets everyone know, well, you know what, we're going to need to keep that the Patriot Act in effect and need the NSA to monitor all of our online communications because now ISIS has an online jihadi help desk to train people how to get around the government surveillance. Now, I'm sure everyone out there has watched The Matrix. If you have not, I recommend you go out and do that right away. Uh, But a report came out here just about a week or so ago where NASA uh, was talking about a theory that someone had put forth that we are potentially living in this Matrix-like simulation where everything we are doing is sort of a pre-program. And I know a lot of people talk about that with just the way television shows are and then the way our government works a lot of the times. It, It feels like a lot of things are programmed. But if you think that that is really far-fetched, this is something that the government has been working on for quite some time. They have been working on uh, simulation programs to help create a virtual reality for all of us here in America so that they can understand everything. That is the mastering the human domain that Rob Dew and David Knight uh, broke down in regards to Jade Helm. So here is an extended report on this matrix-like simulation that we could potentially be living in. Our universe might be a matrix-like computer game designed by aliens. (laughs) <laughs> now, this was a theory that was uh, first proposed by a British philosopher, Nick Bostrom, just a few years after the Matrix film was released. So, of course, he could have been influenced by the film. Who knows? Uh, but in his paper, Dr. Bostrom suggests that a race of far-evolved descendants could be behind our digital imprisonment. These futuristic beings, whether they be human or otherwise, could be using virtual reality to stimulate a time in the past or trying to recreate how their remote ancestors lived. So I know that might sound crazy, but NASA actually thinks that he could be right. Now, this is according to Rich Turrell. He is the director of the Center for Evolutionary Computation and Automated Design at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He says that in quantum mechanics, particles do not have a definite state unless they're being observed. One explanation is that we're living within a simulation, seeing what we need to see when we need to see it. And he said he still finds it inspiring that even if we are living in some sort of a simulation or many orders of magnitude down in levels of simulation, somewhere along the way, something escaped the primordial ooze to become us and to result in simulations that made us. And so he thinks that that's cool. 
Well, I don't want to go into too deep of what that might possibly be. David Icke was actually on the Alex Jones show and talked a little bit about what might be behind this digital enslavement. Um, But if you think that virtual reality and living in a simulation uh, is just too far off, totally unreal, well, that is exactly what the United States government has been working on. The NSA's Acquaint program was actually featured on PBS Nova in 2009. Acquaint stands for Advanced Question Answering for Intelligence. And PBS Nova says, with the entire internet and thousands of databases for a brain, the device will be able to respond almost instantaneously to complex questions posed by intelligence analysts. As more and more data is collected through phone calls, credit card receipts, social media, GPS trackers, cell phone geolocation, internet searches, Amazon book purchases, and even easy pass toll records, it may one day be possible to know not just where people are and what they are doing, but what and how they think. So this was many years ago, PBS Nova, it's, you know, they're not huge conspiracy theorists, But think back then, 2009, smart homes and smart tracking apps weren't as prevalent as they are today. So all of this technology, we're basically helping to build our own digital imprisonment. But another AI program, Sentient World Simulation, this was proposed in 2006 and has largely flown under the radar. Sentient World Simulation is a matrix-like reality simulating humanity. It is a mirror model of the real world running in parallel on a computer, and it's designed to predict and evaluate future events and courses of action. SWS provides an environment for testing psychological operations and civil affairs activities. It's capable of illustrating the impact of these activities on populations. So in a parallel world, the Pentagon is running an AI program to see how people will react to propaganda and government-inflicted terror. So they can yank a country's water supply or stage a military coup and see how people are going to react. Now, the military, uh, through all this, is, is seeking to gain full spectrum picture of the everyday reality of people's lives and, of course, the adversaries of the military. So that's why they're tracking protesters and vegan potlucks and uh, the Occupy protests and things like that because they're, they're wanting to see not only who are terrorists, but people who are actively trying to maybe overthrow the world order. So with this upcoming Jade Helm, is this just a drill? Uh, Will soldiers be in place to test the simulation capabilities? Are they wargaming some potential humanitarian emergency scenarios, uh, you know, responding to civil unrest? We did report uh, last year how the U.S. Department of Defense put out a Fed biz op request for an even more game-changing technology to predict societal unrest. They were looking to find some technology that would help them to track all human activities that can be measured. David Knight and Rob Dew gave a really in-depth presentation of a whole nother level of geospatial simulation and how this is tying into Jade Helm. They are mapping humans onto the geological map and they're looking at you at the individual level, every aspect of you. This is where the surveillance pays off for them. This is the geoint, the human domain. And when they say mastering the human domain, It's a very specific term of art from the military. And this has been an evolution. It started off as we're going to get real detailed maps of everything using satellite imagery. Well, now they have these detailed maps. Now they know who lives at what address. And now they're tying that in with your Facebook account, with your Twitter account, with your YouTube videos. So they're measuring your political beliefs. And they can go up and down and go, well, he's kind of for us. This guy's against us. This guy's pulling the party line. This guy isn't. We need to put him on a watch list. And they're using all this for future operations. They're building an infrastructure of tyranny. There's a... There's a legal infrastructure, things like the NDAA. There is a technical infrastructure, things like the capabilities to do dragnet surveillance. And then, of course, there's going to be a military and a law enforcement infrastructure. Those are merging. That's what you have to understand when they talk about the human domain, when they talk about uh, geointelligence, mapping this all together. They're multi-int, taking all of this, multiple intelligence sources, focusing it down to the micro level. They're very concerned, they say in these uh, in these uh, presentations, they're very concerned about one guy with a computer and a video camera because he can have worldwide impact. That's why they're looking at you 
as an individual. Exactly. And now I want to go to this first clip. This is Lieutenant Colonel Al DiLeonardo. This is from the Master of the Human Domain 2010 GeoInt Conference. And he used to run a fusion cell for U.S. Special Forces. Okay, so this is not some ordinary guy. Hey, just like that's the bottom of the Jade Helm logo, Master, Master of the Human, of the human domain. domain. The cell's objectives were to use as much non-traditional data uh, in, from an Intel standpoint. Uh, that means a lot of open source data. To go out and um, do sense making of data so that not only your analysts, but your machine learning, your, your algorithms you could build would, in, would ultimately get to a, a predictive analysis cell. It's very, very hard to do, especially if you don't have all the data. Basically, old data is good data, new data is good data, and all data is good. Um, <laughs> I want it In all. the context of how I view <laughs> human terrain, yeah. somewhat controversial uh, in, some, in some aspects, is, is it's, it's, it's sociocultural information and it becomes, when used in, in intelligence purposes or for sense-making for operations, when you bring it to, to the GeoInt, and I don't, I don't mean to be coy in saying that, when you bring GeoInt to it, uh, the, I, I think it becomes human terrain. You have to reach out and have human people terrain. using um, traditional, not, non-traditional data sets, as you see there That's further to the right. right there. There's and ultimately, layers. as you bring in Esri products in GeoInt, you, you get outputs uh, as, as uh, you know, unclassified examples there of different layers that you would, you would make. It's that open source combined with the classified information, combined with the now, the old and the now, that, that begins to give you the layers you can make to, to make sense of what's really going on. Jakari Jackson here. We have a new report on our site. Student punished for bringing hot pepper to school. This is a young man out of Long Island, a 10th grader. Basically, his family likes to eat spicy food, and, you know, his buddies thought they did too. I uh, stress thought. So he took a hot pepper to school, which is supposed to be, you know, one of the hottest that you can get, hottest you can buy. And uh, his buddies, they partook, and they got sick. They went to the nurse's office, and then the young man was disciplined. I believe the option he was facing was a day of suspension or two days of detention. And yes, I do believe this is overkill just in general, but then they went a step further and compared the hot peppers to this. Ghost pepper ads say they'll knock your socks off. The fad has spread to ghost pepper fast food fries, chili, and burgers. I eat hot food. My family eats hot food. It's just in all blood. The leans were mystified when they say the school likened the peppers to acid. I was told that it's equivalent to giving someone LSD. So there you have it. They said that bringing in a hot pepper was like bringing in LSD, which I most definitely disagree with. But, you know, this is no surprise. We see these things all the time. In Chicago, they're not even allowing parents to pack the lunches anymore, saying that, you know, the school lunch program knows best, even though you can find many examples of the kids being very unhappy with that uh, program that Mrs. Obama is the figurehead for, you know, kids getting suspended for eating their Pop-Tarts the wrong way and, uh, paper guns and playing with guns in their own front yard and it goes on and on and on and then earlier this week we were talking about how the kids couldn't even uh, you know play in their own front yards with forts and tree houses but you know that's a different matter outside the school so this is the type of craziness we have to deal with uh, when you go to the public school system I don't have any kids but it makes me very fearful when, for when I do that they have to deal with this type of crap so you can find more reports on the Alex Jones channel on YouTube we are here to announce the unsealing of charges and the arrests of individuals as part of our long-running investigation into bribery and corruption in the world of organized soccer. It must have been Let's Pretend We Work for the American People Day over at the Department of Justice. Newly appointed United States Attorney General Loretta Lynch dropped the hammer on World Cup soccer executives, issuing warrants for their arrest regarding the accumulation of over $150 million received by employing methods of racketeering, money laundering, and wire fraud. 
the head of the snake of this notorious soccer empire, Sepp Blatter, will of course remain untouched. Bread and circus historically serves as a huge distraction while the real criminals mingle in smoke-filled rooms holding the puppet strings of law enforcement that knows full well how they arrived at their position and where the real line is drawn. And so it goes, while the world watches soccer executives scurrying out like rats, no arrests, no warrants, nothing is done to the instigators of a far greater recent scandal that dealt punishing blows to the economy. Six banks have agreed to pay a combined $5.8 billion to the Justice Department and other regulators. Five of them have pled guilty to criminal charges. Citicorp, JP Morgan, Barclays, and RPS are pleading guilty to charges tied to Forex manipulation, while UBS is pleading guilty to interest rate manipulation charges. They have each agreed to a three year corporate probation period. No scurrying executives, no impending jail time, just a laughable corporate probation period and fines. Who cares if executives of the most powerful banks colluded on rigging interest rates to make billions of dollars? The DOJ doesn't seem to mind that the Department of Defense spent $4 million on taxpayer-funded credit cards for personal charges, including $3.2 million of it at casinos and $100,000 at strip clubs by 646 government cardholders. While the average American family is seeing their health care costs skyrocket, the government throws away billions per year on waste and fraud. Those very same officials spending our taxpayer dollars will be right on board once the cash trough is replaced by digital currency, and that is coming sooner than most people think. A new age of economic totalitarianism, as highlighted by economist Martin Armstrong, is being discussed with zeal in secret meetings in London. Armstrong writes, This idea of eliminating cash first floated as the normal trial balloon to see how the people would take it. Kenneth Rogoff of Harvard University and William Buter, the chief economist at Citigroup, first launched the concept. Their claims have been widely hailed and their papers are now the foundation for the new age of economic totalitarianism that confronts us. Rogoff and Buter have laid the groundwork for the end of much of our freedom and one day will be considered the new Marx with hindsight. Considerations of their arguments have shown how governments can seize all economic power and destroy cash in the process of eliminating all rights. Physical paper money provides the check against negative interest rates, for if they become too great, people will simply withdraw their funds and hoard cash. Furthermore, paper currency allows for bank runs. Eliminate paper currency and what you end up with is the elimination of the ability to demand to withdraw funds from a bank. Our Defense Department squanders billions of taxpayer dollars. We wanted to know how much taxpayer money the government spends on these mysterious micro-purchases. So we found out. Our review found about $20 billion in just about the course of a year. We asked all of these other major federal agencies based here in D.C. for their micro-purchase shopping lists, and all refused. The same cadre of criminals that crashed the economy in 2008 were merely slapped on the old wrist after being caught rigging interest rates. And world governments are colluding to imprison the population with a digital currency that will enslave anyone that doesn't adhere to the impending New World Order system run by a group of elite scum that would become far more powerful than anything we have ever imagined in our worst nightmares. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, as it is called, is an all-out assault on our national sovereignty. It would unconstitutionally transfer legislative powers from the U.S. Congress, our state legislatures, our city and county governments, to multinational corporations and unaccountable international bureaucrats at the World Trade Organization. And Americans are still off in la-la land thinking that the United States has the sovereignty. You know, the International Organization of Securities Commission regulates our market, and there's a Basel Commission on Banking and the uh, BIS, which uh, Bank of International Settlements, these, uh, the Federal Reserve is part of BIS. It regulates banking. You know, the International Criminal Court of Europe is, has jurisdiction over here in the United States. So the American people need to wake up that the, the sovereignty of the United States is gone. Global you know? government's not coming, it's here. Exactly. But twisting a few media moguls' arms to squeeze out bribes within an industry built on kicking a ball around a field is far more important. 
John Baum, Infowars.com. What do you think the TPP is? TTP? No, what is TTP? The DPP? The what? TPP. I, I have no idea. <laughs> nope. I have no idea what that is. I ain't got a clue. I have no idea. Do any of y'all know what the heck the TPP is? TPP? Any of y'all? No. Uh, no. <sighs> Nobody knows what this is. I have no idea. The uh, toilet paper products. The Texas Petroleum uh, people? The terrorist group? I don't know. And my name is a WWE Thunderstruck Roller Coaster. God bless you. Words of wisdom. I would honestly have no idea. Well, she it gives uh, information and and entertaining. Well, I I don't know exactly the words in 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 English. And that's what we call guessing. Probably some Congress thing about homeless men. Tyrannical people in power. Actually, pretty close. Actually, pretty darn close. Toilet paper. The TPP or the Trans Pacific Partnership. Trans. Trans what? Pacific Partnership is a alliance of corporate global businesses that will then be able to, in any of the three segments, Asian, Pacific, European, or American, will be able to bypass any or all of the laws and rules in that place and be able to do away with currency and due process. What do you think about that? Reminds me of what China does with their free market zones. Um, I would definitely have to hear a lot more information because this sounds a lot like a bit of conspiracy theory to me. I think it sounds a little bit far-fetched. <laughs> I'm being totally honest, I just don't care right now. Is that bad? Like, I was just so unprepared for this. Uh, I think that's awesome, dude. Actually, yeah, I think it's awesome. Why? Um, I mean, because we need people like that, I guess, yeah. I literally have no clue. I've never, I haven't watched the news in a while, man. Okay, well, there you have it. He hasn't watched news. None of us have. We just vote for Obama and pray that he doesn't smite us with his mighty hand of vengeance. Um, my first question for you is which party do you uh, support? Third party, libertarian. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. I wanted to make sure I didn't end up on some like anti-Obama or something because it is Texas. <laughs> yes, because that would be devastating. The TPP is fine. Just don't insult the Lord and Savior, Barack Obama. Now, joining me now in studio is David Knight. And you are watching a very live edition of this InfoWars Nightly News. We have just received word the Biggs has landed. It's going to take him about 30 minutes to get to the site. Uh, then we're going to be Skyping in with him live. If everything goes well, um, I wanted to let you know that you can tweet us your questions on Twitter. Tweet them directly to our Twitter handles. I am Leanne McAdoo. Uh, Do just created a Twitter today. You can follow him. That's Do's News with a Z at the end. And David Knight. Liberty Tarian. That's Liberty Tarian. Not Liberty Tarian. Liberty. <laughs> Liberty Tarian. And so we'll... We'll have the guys pull those up so you can see for yourselves. Now, earlier I mentioned that Dennis Hastert, he was the former House Speaker, took responsibility, you know, took credit for helping to pass the Patriot Act in mm -hmm. 2001. He was so happy about that, helped get it reauthorized again in 2005. And now it is that very Patriot Act and the provisions that were in there uh, that were used to indict him on charges related to paying three and a half million dollars in hush money, which the, the federal law enforcement was able to detect that using the Patriot Act. You know, it's kind of interesting that this guy kind of came out of nowhere and he was in place when September 11th came along when they needed somebody to push the Patriot Act through. And, you know, one of the things that we're going to see in this, and of course, uh, Alex Jones talked with Wayne Madsen a great deal about this today. We're going to have a clip about that uh, uh, towards the end of the after this uh, segment. But they were talking about why is it that we have so many corrupt politicians and leadership of both parties. 
And of course, the answer is they need people who are compromised that they can use as puppets. And so then the other question becomes, why did they wait until now to come after Dennis Hastert? Why he was in there the uh, longest time a Republican has ever been Speaker of the House for eight years. Uh, now they're coming after him. Uh, very interesting, the timing that, uh, that this is coming up with. But I, I've got some other questions here, too. Let, let's take a look at what they're really coming after him for. Because, you know, we ought to also ask the question, how did a guy go from being uh, a basketball, I'm sorry, a wrestling coach in a high school? How did he go from that to becoming a multimillionaire who could pay millions of dollars to a blackmailer? Because that's what happened here. Right. We should look at the obscene concentration of power and money in Washington and what this tells us. Of course, we see it with the Clintons. We see it with the Bushes. We see it with Obama himself. This is a guy who was uh, had never done anything in his life except be a community organizer. He was selected by the elites and put into place just like Dennis Hastert. And so the question about this becomes, and we'll talk about what the charges are, uh, but it's really, you know, he, he got this cash, they're saying legally. Mm -hmm. But now he is facing a very long time in prison for cash that he picked up legally. But let's first talk about some of these charges that have come up. There was an interesting uh, find. I think it was The Hill that found this uh, uh, last year on uh, C-SPAN. Dennis Hastert was on talking about his speakership and it was open lines and they had this creepy call. This was put out by Drudge. Let's let's go to that clip right here. Okay, you don't have that clip just yet. Okay, we're going to we're going to go back to that clip, but basically he was a high school coach as I mentioned, wrestling coach before uh, he became a uh, politician. Okay, got that clip. Let's run that clip. Noy is our next call. Here's Bruce. Uh, Independent Line. Hi. Hello, Danny. Hey, how are you doing? Pretty good. Remember me from Yorkville? Bruce, you're on. Go ahead yeah, with your question ahead. coming. <laughs> I think he's going <laughs> <laughs> so this just guy just calls up. To troll him there. Remember he just me calls up. Yorkville? Yeah, you remember me from Yorkville because that's the name of the high school, the town, the high school. Mm. Uh, evidently, he was paying this guy. Had agreed to pay this individual three million dollars, Leanne. And after he paid out about one point seven million, he stopped. So maybe this guy was kind of firing a shot across the bow at that point. Now we know that there are multiple charges. This was leaked out today by uh, people with the Justice Department, the FBI, the ones investigating this. They called up uh, the L.A. Times and they were telling them this is uh, allegations of sexual misconduct with children that he had in high school, underage uh, people that he had in high school. And so it's interesting that they're pulling this out and they're shopping this around because that's not what they're going to send him to jail for. Right. The statute of limitations has long since uh, gone away. That was uh, 35 years or more because he became a politician in the 19 about 1980, 81. So these charges would be 35 years old. There's a statute of limitations. So he's not going to go to jail for that. But they're creating this whisper campaign right, right now to discredit him and to keep people from asking, why is he going to be going to jail? Because the reason he's going to be going to jail, and that's what we want to talk about, is this structuring charge. Right. This is something that he helped to create as part of the Patriot Act. And he's going to be hoisted by his own petard right into jail because it looks like they could get as much as 530 years against him. They're wow. saying they're going to take each of these structuring charges. What he did to pay this uh, blackmailer off, first he took out 15 uh, uh, withdrawals mm -hmm. of $50,000. And again, it's his money, okay? But they, that was reported to the FBI as being something that was suspicious. So they began an investigation. They talked to him and he said, well, I just don't trust the banks. That's I'm keeping the money. I'm just, uh, you know, it basically wasn't really any of their business why he was taking this money out. At that point, though, he decided he was going to do it secretly. So then he started taking out withdrawals at less than ten thousand dollars so that it wouldn't get noticed, except that he'd already been noticed. So they they started uh, monitoring his account. He did that one hundred and six times. For each of those, they say that they're going to charge him up to a maximum of five years for each of those accounts. So wow. that would be 530 years. Now, consider this, Leanne. If he had been convicted of sexually molesting a minor, in Illinois, he would have gotten between six to 30 years. 530 years for structuring. If he had robbed a bank, because this is his money that he's withdrawing, if he'd gone right. in and robbed a bank, he would have gotten six to 55 years. The upper limit would be if it was armed robbery and he hurt people. Okay. Wow. But for taking out his own cash mm -hmm. and not filing the paperwork with the government, 
this law that he helped to pass yeah. could possibly send him to jail for 530 years. And, and so we have to really ask when we're looking at this, they're going to try to get you focused on his sexual perversion. Right. And that's that's the, the Department of Justice made the decision to not even include that in, in the indictment to specify yes. his past. He his had previous conduct. bad acts. Right. Quote but they just but they went around and spent the day putting that in the media's ear that. In quotes, Hastert paid a man to conceal sexual misconduct while the man was a student at the high school where Hastert taught. So they're wanting everyone to just say, oh, throw him in jail. He's Mm -hmm. a pervert. What an awful person where, like you're saying, uh, it's actually what's happening with his own money, where if you were to um, if he was to have decided some something like this with his attorney where they would have paid this person off to, to, you know, to not take it to court or something like that, that's perfectly legal. That's yeah. a legal thing to do, yeah. but because he did the yeah. structuring process, yes, that's exactly. where you get into trouble. Exactly, because of he the could Patriot have done, Act. Absolutely, and, and I think it's outrageous that the statute of limitations has run out on the sexual molestation of minors. I don't think there ought to be one, but mm-hmm. nevertheless, that's what the law is. But we see that these laws, these structuring laws, they began a long time ago, and they basically have created an entire industry around this. And we're going to talk about what. Uh, a, an assistant attorney general said to the anti-money laundering conference, there's an entire industry within the banks. And basically, you need to understand that although you may think that Dennis Hastert deserves this, and he does, he deserves to go to jail uh, for what he's done. He doesn't deserve to go to jail for taking his own cash out of the bank. And you need to understand that uh, if you support that, you're in line to have that done to you as well. We've got a couple of cases just to make it uh just, just so that you understand and see what, how this works out for individuals. Of course, we've had people who uh, get their, their cash stolen from them constantly when they're stopped on the road by the highway patrol. Mm-hmm. We just had a recent case of a guy who was traveling cross country. He had cash on him. He was going to California to start a new business. And the TSA on the uh, trains uh, confiscated that cash. So that is civil asset forfeiture. Now, that is bad enough. But then it gets even worse with structuring because what's bad about civil asset forfeiture, they say it's civil. So we don't have to give you due process. We don't have to charge you with a crime. We don't have to convict you in court in a trial. We can just merely say that your property was involved in committing this crime. And we charge your property with criminal action, this inanimate object, and seize that property or they call it forfeit that property is the way that they put it. So we see that this has affected people in a variety of ways. But we've seen in North Carolina, just within the last week and a half, two cases come to light of a uh, one uh, attorney from uh, the Department of Justice that's uh, based in North Carolina going after two small businesses and taking all of the money out of their accounts. In one case, it was a convenience store. They took $107,000 out of this man's convenience store. In the other case, uh, it was a business. They'd been in business for 30 years. Mm. And because of money that they were uh, withdrawing, they said uh, that it it was structured. Very subjective, the way they do this. They said it was uh, structured. They confiscated all of their property. This is the way it's been reported. Now, the the first guy, the uh, convenience store owner, Lyndon McClellan, had a bank account for his convenience store. It was seized by the IRS. And at first, he didn't understand why. The IRS said that it suspected that he was violating federal structuring laws. Do you understand that? It suspected. Yeah, he wasn't even charged with a crime. That's right. They had no evidence. They just suspected Mm -hmm. that he was structuring deposits. Now, if you've got a convenience store and you're collecting cash, uh, when you deposit the, the cash, that may not be any criminal intent whatsoever. And they merely look at the uh, amount of money that you put in or the amount of money that you take out. And they subjectively determine that you were trying to avoid going over that $10,000 limit. And of course, if you've got a business, if you're anyone who's ever had a business, you understand if you're dealing in cash, that's not a lot of money. That's not, that is a lot of money for us as individuals. It's not a lot of money for a, a, a business to do that. Now, this is what the attorney, right. uh, the, the federal attorney, U.S. attorney Steve West said to McClellan. He said, don't go public. He said, this will only make things worse for you. He said, it just ratchets up feelings within the agency. Get that? In other words, don't make us mad at you. Don't go public because we'll get mad at you. So he says, here's the deal. I'll return 50% of the money and this will stop this right now. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. He went public and the public was outraged about that. 
They've now returned that money, that $107,000 to him, which basically would put him out of business. That was his entire bank account that he had for his business. Then we find a few days later, the same U.S. attorney, Steve West in North Carolina, going after another small business. This is a small business out of Raleigh, North Carolina, Tom Bednar and his wife. They said they were looking, they had a bank account uh, for their three decade old business, 30 years old, Marla Enterprises. They were amazed to find that the bank account was empty. The bank called them and wanted to know how they were going to cover $18,000 in outstanding checks that they had written. So you have to understand the cash flow involved in a business, the amount of money is much larger than you're going to see as an individual. That's why $115,000 is not that much. They just wrote $18,000 worth of checks. Now, in this case, it wasn't the IRS. It was the Secret Service that seized the money, but it was done by the same U.S. attorney. He said, we got no warning, nothing at all. And so uh, this guy did the same thing to them. Again, he said, I'll give you back half of it. And they said, no, <laughs> we don't owe anything. We didn't commit a crime. We didn't do anything. And he said, okay, okay, I'll give you all of it back except for $10,000. And they said, absolutely not. This is what he had to say. This is what the business owner had to say. He said, my wife and I have run a business our entire lives. It's hard-earned, legitimate money. Why should I give it up and let it be stolen from us, whether it's $1 or $100? Exactly right. He committed no crime. This is a criminal government, and this is the kind of government that Dennis Hastert created right. that is still with us, that is still abusing everybody. And then get this. Even though they have had some minor reforms of this, they had the uh, Civil Asset Forfeiture Reform Act that was just recently passed, under that, these people who have had uh, charges uh, made against them by their banks, they've had legal fees that they've had to go through to try to get their money back that was stolen from them by the U.S. government. These people are entitled to get back $25,000 in legal fees. The government just said, we're not going to do that. I mean, this is the law. This is, a re this is a law that was passed, Civil Asset Forfeiture Reform Act, that was passed to stop these very kind of abuses from attorneys uh, that work for the U.S. government like Stephen West in North Carolina. And he just simply says, no, we're not going to obey that law. They pick which laws they want to, uh, to obey, which ones they don't. They violate the Constitution with all of them. And they're stealing people's money right out of their accounts. It's right. absolutely and who they amazing. want to come after and prosecute because obviously yes. the banks are too big to jail. They yes. won't come after them when they're... Well, and, and let's, let's understand. Exactly. That's, that's exactly the point. Look at the largest money laundering case ever, HSBC. They were fined $1.9 billion. Again, that sounds like a lot of money, but not for HSBC. Do you understand how much that fine is? And, and let me make it clear. HSBC really was engaged in criminal activity. They've come to us and they've said, we need to have this surveillance of your accounts we need to have this massive uh, system of reporting from the banks spying on you and sending reports to us all the time. We need to have that because this might be a, you might be doing something, moving cash around to launder money for drug cartels or for terrorist groups. HSBC was laundering money for drug cartels, for terrorist groups. There's no question about it. They got caught red handed. They're the kind of person or kind of entity that this law was written for trying to stop this, not for people who are hardworking small businessmen who just happen to be depositing money without any regard, uh, not trying to break the law, not understanding even what the law is. And yet the government takes their entire account. They took one point nine billion dollars from HSBC. That was less than one month's profit for that company, right. less than one month's profit. If you look at that on an annual basis, that's eight percent. That, if you look at that as a tax for them doing business illegally with drug cartels and money launders, okay, that 8% tax, if you want to call that, the money laundering tax, that's less than their income tax. Of course, they don't pay any income tax anyway, but as less than a corporation would pay, less yeah. than an individual would pay, none of you out there are paying 8% income tax. And uh, so they get away with an 8% tax, even though they were guilty as could be with us. Right. And that's the other thing is just not pointing out that the real crime should be here with Hastert. He entered in Congress with a net worth of no more than two hundred and seventy thousand dollars and then exited Congress with somewhere between four million and 17 million. Same thing with the Clintons. That's a crime. Exactly. Same thing with the Clintons. Same thing with the Obamas. OK, uh, of course, Hillary says when she got out of Congress, 
they were flat broke. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the, uh, but so that's why they had to up their speaking fees. Yeah. Yeah. That's the real problem. And I don't think you can stop it. See campaign finance reform isn't going to get there. Uh, this is something that these guys are getting after they get elected. The problem is not campaign finance reform. Unfortunately, the problem is that there's so much power in Washington that it is a black hole for criminals. Okay. It's a black hole for these type of people like Dennis Hastert, who they know doesn't have much sense. I mean, this is a guy that the, the, uh, the FBI's come to him and ask him why he took out, uh, $750,000 and $50,000 increments. Mm -hmm. And he lies about it. And then he starts trying to, uh, structure his deposits. And he should know better because he passed the law. Exactly. Okay. If he doesn't know what's in the law, maybe he didn't read it after he passed it. Right. You know, he didn't do <laughs> what Pelosi did, did, right? Pass it to find it. Yeah. Yeah. But of all people, he should know what's in it. So he's not a very bright bulb. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he's somebody who's crooked. He's corrupt. Somebody that they can control. Okay. So. Well, and he's obviously been a sociopath and a predator, mm -hmm. you know, from, mm -hmm. from his early days as a coach. Yes. So there's a lot we can learn from this, but I hope people will understand the, the legal corruption, the fallacies underlying civil asset forfeiture and structuring as a crime. Now, Rand Paul and uh, other individuals have co-sponsored this. I, I can't remember the co-sponsor in the house. They have sponsored now twice what they call the fair act. The fair act would stop civil asset forfeiture and it would stop the uh, the uh, crime, quote unquote, of structuring if it's not being used to hide something that is illegal activity like HSBC. So uh, hopefully that will go through. People need to understand what this is. And let me give you something from Woody Guthrie. This is the guy who, uh, you know, wrote uh, this land is your land. This man land is mine. He said, as I as through this world, I've wondered, I've seen lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. OK, Dennis Haster is that kind of man. Mm. This attorney, Stephen West, this U.S. attorney who is robbing small businesses throughout central North Carolina is that kind of man. He is nothing but a thief with a fountain pen and he's not obeying the law. He won't even obey the reform of this unconstitutional act. Well, and all I can say is hopefully that with this happening right there in Congress, as they're trying to figure out if they're going to reauthorize the Patriot Act or not, everyone there can can sort of see that they're not above the law or that they exactly. might, you know. Hey it, guys, this is Rob Dew. I just wanted to give you all a quick update on uh, what's going on. We just got contact from Joe Biggs. He's acquired a his rental car and is on his way to the site. So I would say 30, 35 minutes he'll be there depending on traffic, what it's like. We're, we're about two hours ahead here in Texas. So it's about eight o'clock now. So it's what, six o'clock there. And uh, so just to give everybody an update out who's watching us uh, online on the YouTube stream and on the Infowars.com forward slash show stream and on PrisonPlanet.tv, all the streams uh, out there. We appreciate everybody watching. Uh, Joe Biggs is on his way. We're going to, as soon as he gets there, we'll you know get a uh, rundown from him of what he sees, what's going on. And I do believe he's um, going to be open carrying his head down Provectus rifle. So. <laughs> Good. Uh, we'll be able to say it. Hopefully not in action. The Second Amendment there. So yeah. just uh, give you that quick update. Uh, David, bre great breakdown there on the on the real hidden truth of this Dennis Hastert thing. It's, it's got a lot of angles to it, but I think you've really nailed it. Well, Rob, uh, I hope that with this, uh, you know, they're still talking about the Patriot Act, as, as Leanne mentioned, and I hope that uh, people will keep this in mind. People don't understand what's going on. We just saw that with a report from Rex Jones. They don't know what the TPP is. If you asked any of these people what structuring is, they wouldn't know. Businesses don't know. They don't understand how the government is robbing us. And that's really a big part of the problem. Well, and they think they're above the problem that they're yes. creating. For the they think it's not going to happen to them. But look, mm -hmm. no matter you don't have to have a business. People are getting their cash stolen from them as they're traveling in cars, traveling on trains across this country. Uh, whatever you're carrying, whatever the amount is, it's a big amount to you. Right. And actually, people who don't have a lot of money are really in a worse position than someone who does, who has a business that they can use for collateral because they can hire lawyers to get this back. You don't get a public defender to help you recover your cash when they seize it with civil asset forfeiture because they say it's not a, a, a criminal act, so you don't get a public defender even. So if it's a small amount of money and you're poor, even if you want to do this on the, on the point of principle, it isn't, you're not going to be able to do it because you're not going to have the money to challenge these people in court. And also, too, there with the the veiled threats that the the police are issuing to people that they're confiscating their money, um, 
you were mentioning that they were kind of also sending out those same threats to the bankers themselves. Absolutely. They are they are going after individuals. They're going after small um, businesses. They let the big criminals, the big banks like HSBC, who are actually doing criminal money laundering, they let them go with very small penalty. But they're threatening the small banks, just like everything else. It's the small right. banks are going to come after them. And so there was this uh, uh, conference of uh, anti-money laundering uh, individuals, anti-money laundering and financial crime conference. And this was back in uh, March. And this was the assistant attorney general, uh, Caldwell, who went and addressed them. And what he did was he used this occasion to threaten the small banks. And he says uh, that we're, uh, he also talks about a, pro- a, a process where they're going after uh, kleptocracy asset recovery initiative, carry. I guess it's kind of like cash and carry, you know, where they go after uh, a foreign government. They say, well, we determine that this foreign government we think is corrupt. So we're going to call it a kleptocracy. And we're going to say that wherever we can get to any of their assets, we're going to just steal them. Okay. Now, of course, they're not going to give it back to the people. They're going to keep it. The U.S. government is going to keep it. They're going to keep it just like law enforcement keeps the uh, stuff that they uh, steal. But that's the whole point. The irony of this is that our government is the biggest kleptocracy on the planet. It is a, it is a rule by thieves. That's what these people are doing throughout this. But I want to I want to read to you what he said to these bankers. He said when the criminal division, that's what he represents. And these are the people that will be uh, uh trying Dennis Hastert. He said, when the criminal division evaluates a company's compliance policy during an investigation, we don't only look at how the policy reads on paper. We also look at messages that are conveyed to employees, including in-person meetings, emails, telephone calls, compensation. In other words, this is a full-on East German surveillance state, okay, where they're going to look at everything about your business. They're going to uh, complete surveillance of everything. It's not going to be like the privileged people like uh, Hillary Clinton who say they've got a private email server and you can't see that. No, they're going to come in and look at everything in these banks. They say we look at it as a whole, a company that's meaningfully stressed compliance, have they? Or if they're faced in a conflict between compliance and profits, does the company choose profits? In the anti-money laundering and sanctions context in particular, effective compliance requires more. And I'd like to highlight a few points. First, you need to know your customer. In other words, spy incessantly on your customer, constantly report everything about your customer. And he says, it's not enough just to uh, be filing these uh, reports. We want you to do more, more reports, and we want you to contact law enforcement completely. They say part of this is information sharing. Okay. And he says, the second thing is, if this is a foreign bank and they have a U.S. branch, then this foreign bank that happens to have a branch somewhere in the United States they need to spy on all of their customers in that other country. So if they've got a, uh, if it's an Irish bank, uh, they want them to spy on all the Irish customers. I know this is an international show. We've got a lot of people who watch us from around the world. Here's the point, folks. If you don't live in the United States, make sure you don't do business with a bank that has a branch in the United States. Because if you do, the federal government wants that Irish bank, even if you never set foot in the U.S., they want that Irish bank to report everything about you, anything that is suspicious. And then if some federal agency wants to assume that you did something suspicious, they will confiscate your cash, even though you never set foot in the United States. That's the kind of kleptocracy we have. You want a real kleptocracy? It's right here in Washington. Wow. And he says the majority of financial institutions file suspicious activity reports, but we encourage those institutions to consider whether to take more action, specifically alert law enforcement authorities about the problem. They may be able to seize funds or initiate an investigation or take other proactive steps. And he goes on to say, you know, you might think this is going to cost you a lot of money to hire all these anti-money laundering personnel. But he said it, it may not be a profit center, but an investment will pay off because if you don't do it, we will come after you is essentially what he's saying to them. Wow. So okay. you're investing in yeah. not it's being protect- investigated. It's a protection racket. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. These people are nothing but gangsters. Look at the way this uh, U.S. attorney, Stephen West, comes to these people. You know, he steals their money. He has no reason to steal their money. And then he says, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll give you back half of it. Don't get you us know. ratcheted up. No. Yeah. Don't talk to the press. Don't. Don't tell anybody about this. I'll give you half of it back. It's like, you stole this from me. I didn't do anything wrong. And I'm glad these two businesses went out with this. I suspect 
Uh, we just saw these two things pop up all at once. We saw the second one pop up in North Carolina. I suspect the re- only reason we saw the second one pop up is because of the publicity that the first one got. And I think that now the local news in North Carolina is looking for this. If we make this go national, I bet this is going to be popping up everywhere. This is standard right. operating procedure. As, as bad as this is with this particular attorney, Stephen West, this is not something that is just coming out of that one North Carolina office. This is national and it is international, as I just pointed out. They will steal your money if you live in another country, never set foot in the United States, if your bank not even a U.S. bank that you're dealing with, but if your foreign bank has a branch in the United States, they can use that to steal your money. Wow, that's unbelievable. I didn't know about that yeah. aspect of the deal at all. And it's important, like like you have mentioned, what they really want everyone to focus on is the sexual indiscretions of this man's past. And, of course, you know he's the embodiment of everything that's sleazy there in Washington uh, with that, but that's not what they came after him for and you the know, issue that's we, here is the overcriminalization. Exactly. We saw that with Waco, if you remember. When they went into Waco, of course, this is something that was already staged. Uh, they had uh, the press. They called the press to come and watch what they were going to do. The key word to kick it off was showtime when they atta- attacked the uh, Branch Davidians. But when all of this went south and everything blew up in their face, what they did was they didn't talk about any federal firearms uh, issues that they were coming after him for. OK, this was the ATF. They were only coming after him. They only had the jurisdiction to come after him for some kind of a firearms uh, problem. They didn't talk about that whatsoever. And of course, it was nothing again except some paperwork charges OK, that he had not paid. What they did was they smeared him with allegations of child abuse, child sex abuse. And when I looked at that, it's like, give me a break. That's not why this happened. Right. You know, it was hard to get information back in that day. We didn't have uh, internet. We had to rely on uh, uh, just just billboards that were passing things around. So it was difficult to get information. But when you saw that, you knew there was something wrong. When the government was vilifying these people saying, this is all about child abuse. And it's like, if it was about child abuse, the ATF wouldn't have been there with an armed raid. They wouldn't have called the press to come in there. It was simply a, a beard. And so now they're doing that again. They're trying. They don't want you to focus on structuring. They don't want you to wake up and understand what's going on with civil asset forfeiture before it happens to you or your family. But you need to wake up. You need to understand what's going on because it will happen to you. It will happen to people that, you know, if we don't stop this, this is a criminal kleptocracy thieves. And of course, these thieves uh, were put into place by people like Dennis Hastert. So he deserves what he gets. But we don't deserve to be abused by his perversion of the legal system. And that's the key thing. Yeah. I mean, that's just, you nailed it right there with that. I was, it makes me want to leave this country, but where would we go? I mean, it seems as though it's. Yeah. They'll steal your money no matter what country you're in. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So, well now on the Alex Jones show today, we had Wayne Madsen come on and he was actually the investigative journalist who broke this Hastert blackmail sex scandal story in 2006. Nine years ago. Yeah, he was the first yeah. one to come out about it. Of course, you know, conspiracy theorists and, and all of that. Uh, but here, you know, years later. Um, Vin That's what they call the anybody who's an investigative journalist. You're called a conspiracy theorist. If your investigation uncovers criminal or embarrassing information about people in power, you're a conspiracy theorist. That's their, their pushback. Right. And that's kind of what you're supposed to do as an investigator is you're yeah. supposed to look at what's underneath the service and what's not, you know, what they're not just telling you right there. If you follow it wherever it leads, that's uh, that's what they'll do to protect themselves. <laughs> well, let's take a look at this report from Wade Madsen on the Alex Jones show today. Okay, uh, on September 30th, 2006, I, I first reported on the web, my website uh, about this past misconduct of Dennis Hastert. Remember, he was Speaker of the House, third in line under presidential succession to the presidency. If I can just read this, because it's very interesting, this, this uh, background of Hastert and how he got to his, his position. Uh, what I reported on September 30th, 2006, nine years ago, congressional sources told me that Hastert, while working from 1964 to 1980 as a popular history government teacher and wrestling coach at Yorkville High School in Yorkville, Illinois, uh, a suburb of Chicago, was the subject of persistent rumors about inappropriate contact 
with male members of his high school wrestling team. The culture of the times usually resulted in such alleged behavior being covered up by public and parochial school authorities. However, the rumors were enough for his Yorkville constituency to reject him when he ran for an open seat in the Illinois House of Representatives in 1980. However, Hastert lucked out when another sitting Republican House member who represented the three-seat district had a stroke and declined to run for re-election. The GOP machine bosses selected Hastert as the replacement candidate. Hastert served in Springfield from 80 to 86, six years to make the transformation from wrestling coach with that cloud surrounding himself to politician. In 1986, Hastert received another unexpected promotion after incumbent Republican U.S. Representative John Groberg was nominated for the by the GIP, GOP for a second term. He was diagnosed with terminal cancer and fell into a coma. The Illinois Republican Convention selected Hastert as a replacement on the ticket, a virtual election of the U.S. House in a strongly Republican district. So that that's how Hastert got in to the House of Representatives. He 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 was rejected because of the rumors. Uh, surrounding him uh, him as a high school wrestling coach. I heard from people in that particular town, Yorkville, and nearby that Hastert uh, was caught uh, uh, with, you know, inappropriate sexual contact with underage male members of his high school wrestling team. He And isn't it funny, he only got into these uh, political positions because either somebody had a stroke or somebody died of cancer. I remember uh, walk, uh, walking with um, uh, a friend of mine, and we encountered uh, Charlie Rangel back in those days in, in the uh, rotunda. And, and we, you know, if you're with somebody and they kind of look at something and it's like an inside, they have some inside information. Well, here comes Hastert walking across the rotunda with a, uh, a young, uh, very young uh, male page. Obviously, you, you see members of Congress with their senior staffers, chief of staff all the time, but this was very unusual. And I noticed a wry smile on Congressman Rangel's face, like he knew something. <laughs> and, uh, you know, with, with, you know, the neurolinguistics on that one said everything. And um, I actually had the opportunity of running into Hastert after he was speaker at the GOP convention in 2000 in Tampa. There was kind of a uh, a, 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 a people traffic jam in the um, uh, arena, and uh, he was standing right next to me. And I looked at him and I said, "How how's retired life treating you, uh, Mr. Speaker?" Using the honorific, uh, uh, I know he wasn't speaker, but it's the DC thing. Um, and he said, um, "He said good." And then he said, "I oh, well, I did, I forgot your name." And I told him, and the guy turned pale and said, I got to get back to my Illinois delegation. So clearly he recalled the reports that I had on his misconduct back in 06. Oh, you're definitely on target.